Having Europe on your doorstep is a glorious benefit to living in the UK. In an hour or two, you could be in Spain, or France, or Spain. What a treat. But that ease of continental access sometimes mean you overlook your neighbors. And I am, unfortunately and rather embarrassingly, guilty of that. I haven't spent nearly enough time in Scotland. The occasional glancing visit for work, never giving myself a real chance to explore a gem of a city like this, Edinburgh. Well, it's finally time to right that wrong. Edinburgh, show me what you got. Scotland is actually a place that I have family connections to and, and not in one of those weird, I've lived in Des Moines for six generations, but I'm actually Scottish. My grandfather was Glaswegian, born and bred, thick accent that I could barely understand as a kid. So I feel an affinity with this place, if not a sense of identity, but it is spectacular and, and welcoming and wonderful. And I, this is actually the first time I've been here properly, but it has felt in a weird way very, very familiar to me. Edinburgh Airport, located 10 miles west of the city, is by far the busiest airport in Scotland with services within the UK, Europe, North America, and the Middle East. Remember, Scotland has nearly 800 islands, and for many of them, air services are a vital link. So whether you're coming to, from, regionally, locally, internationally, if you're coming to this area, you're coming through here. The best way to get into town from the airport is the tram, and who doesn't love a good tram? They run every eight to 10 minutes from right outside arrivals, and the 30 minute journey into town will cost you seven pounds 50 for a single, or nine pounds 50 for an open return. So not the cheapest in the world, but what price convenience these days. You need to buy a ticket before you get on the tram, but there are ticket machines right at the tram station that accept debit and credit cards and cash, but they do not give change. There are also buses available to most parts of the city and beyond. Lothian buses operate four routes to the city from the airport. All buses accept contactless payments and tickets are the same price on all buses, £4.50 for a single or £7.50 for an open return, and they can be bought from the Lothian ticket desk in the domestic arrivals area or on the bus itself. You could also be arriving in Edinburgh on a train, and if you do, it'll be here in Waverley Station. From here, you can connect to regional and services throughout the UK. London is only four and a half hours away. I know that may sound like a long time, but if you factor in airport security, faffery, and all that nonsense, in many cases, it's actually faster to take the train from London to Edinburgh than it is to fly. And I would actually recommend it because the views along the way are spectacular. Once you have arrived in Edinburgh proper, however, getting around is easy, and it's made even easier by the fact that it is a relatively compact city. Now, the public transport infrastructure might not feel as robust as other European cities, but it's more than adequate and will get you around wherever you need to go. Buses are the main form of transport in Edinburgh. Now, all buses have tap-in contactless card readers, so you get on the bus, you tap in, and you're good to go. You have the added benefit of a £4.80 daily cap, so after two journeys, everything else is essentially free. Now, you can buy a £5 daily ticket, but let's be honest, why would you? Why not just tap in and enjoy that sweet, sweet daily cap, as the kids say. It's worth noting that if you do decide to buy a day pass for the bus, you can also use it on the trams, except for the airport stop. They always get you with stuff like that. But as I always say, the best way to explore a city is on foot, and Edinburgh is perfect for that. It's a small, compact city, lots of pedestrianized areas, and many of the key sites are within just a few minutes' walk of each other. That being said, a lot of cobblestones, quite a lot of hills. In fact, the route on Prince's Street up the mound towards the castle, it's gonna take a little bit of effort, but it's absolutely worth it for the view. There's a strange disconnect between Scotland's reputation or stereotype, both abroad and in the UK, and reality. 
The reality is this is quantifiably the safest big city in the UK and you can feel it. So I don't think you need to take any other precautions than you wouldn't ordinarily take when you're visiting a new place. So keeping your valuables in sight and taking care on public transport. You don't need to do anything else beyond that, despite what Saturday Night Live might have told you. Fire bombs, pro and con. Pro. This episode of Attaché is sponsored by Soundcore by Anchor. These are the Liberty 4NC Airbuds, the latest Airbuds from Soundcore. And you know what? They're pretty freaking awesome. My favorite feature is the adaptive noise canceling. What does that mean? Well, when I'm traveling, which is basically all the time, and I'm on public transport or walking through a busy city or on an airplane, the noise canceling actually adapts to the environment. In fact, they can reduce noise by up to an industry-leading 98.5%. And with studio quality sound and phenomenal battery life, complete with wireless charging, they are the ultimate travel companion. So do Attaché and yourself a favor, click on the link below, grab a pair, and shrink the noise wherever you go with the Liberty 4NC from Soundcore. Mike Myers once said that he thought most Scottish food was based on a dare. And that stereotype of Scottish food wasn't helped by the invention of the deep-fried Mars bar in the 90s, a stigma that Scotland has struggled to shake ever since. But there's greatness here, a lot of it. There's seafood everywhere, for starters. Scotland is famous for its fish, and it takes glorious forms like Cullen skink, a fish soup not a million miles away from clam chowder. It's delicious. There's haggis everywhere in all shapes and sizes. And who can resist the siren song of the full Scottish breakfast? And then there's the comfort food, the handheld boys. A lot of my favorite food in Scotland is portable and handheld, which who doesn't love convenience, including this, the beautiful Bridie. Now they're originally from Forfar, which is about an hour and a half north of Edinburgh, but you can find them all over Scotland. If you're familiar with a Cornish pasty, this will be familiar to you. Short crust or flaky pastry filled with minced beef, beef suet, and butter. So health food, really, and seasoned with salt and pepper. They are absolutely delicious, lovely, hot, great way to warm up on a cold Edinburgh day. They're better than pasties. Fighting words. There's a fun little convention here as well. If there's one hole in the variety which the baker has made. That means it's plain, there's no onions. Two holes means there are onions in it. So I didn't know this until very recently, but it's also a convention that is followed by another Edinburgh treat. The Scotch pie. Now, I was doing a little bit of reading about these. I, I love them. They were originally filled with mutton. Uh, and the article I read said, now they are filled with a quote, undefinable meat. <laughs> It's beef, it's just beef, it's not undefinable. And the good ones are really good. Slightly spiced, not greasy. That's what you gotta be looking for. If they look a bit greasy, they're gonna taste really greasy. You're looking for something that looks a lot like this. Beautiful, flaky crust. And even though they're hot, they're handheld, so you don't have to faff with them. I absolutely love these. They are ubiquitous throughout Scotland. You cannot come to Edinburgh, any, frankly, any place in Scotland without Wandering around with one of these. That and a mug of ball for Life's a good one. I promised that not all Scottish food or Edinburgh food is handheld pastries, but I had to share this with you. I'd never heard of these. My friend Ross recommended it to me. The macaroni pie. Very similar to the scotch pie, except it's not covered and it's filled with macaroni and cheese. What a great recommendation. We don't have these in England. So good. Of course it is, it's a pie filled with mac and cheese. <laughs> we don't really talk about sweets very often on this show, or maybe not nearly enough. But this is something that you really can't come to Scotland and not eat. Tablet. It may look like fudge, English fudge, not American fudge. And it's not dissimilar in the way it's prepared. It's condensed milk, sugar, and butter that's boiled. But it is actually very different from English fudge, which is quite creamy and soft. And this is much more brittle. You can find it mass produced, but the texture is really grainy and in an unpleasant way. When it's made like this fresh, 
It's absolutely delicious. It does taste a little bit like diabetes, but that, that's fine. It's grainy, but in a pleasant way, really soft and buttery and butterscotchy, caramelly. It's absolutely delicious. And it's one of those things where it hasn't really spread outside of Scotland. Fudge has, obviously, but this is a uniquely Scottish treat. And uh, I'd encourage you to find it in a place where they make it, not just where they sell it. And with that homegrown ethos firmly in mind, combined with a sugar high rivaled only by that of a Quickie Mart squishy, we literally sprinted the Royal Mile for a wee dram, as the locals might say. There's a whiskey up there for everybody. You know, it might take us three or four drams to find it, but we'll get there for you. Kyle of the venerable Scotch Malt Whiskey Society was kind enough to distill the key facts about whiskey for us. Distill. Get it? I give up with you people. So the kind of tagline is to create the world's most colorful whiskey experiences. One of the things that strikes you as soon as you look at this is all the labels are of the same template. So there's nothing that identifies the distillery or anything else, which I suppose is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You're, you're focused on what it tastes like, not anything associated with where it's from or who made it or how it was made necessarily. Yeah, that's the focus, as I say, kind of the focus is on the single cask aspect. So it is the uniqueness. So while one bottle might be one of 200, when that, that is gone, that flavor is gone forever. Classified, coded, and archived by a panel of tasting experts, the labels on these bottles contain a wealth of information from the flavor profile depicted by color, everything from young and sprightly to oily and coastal, to age, tasting notes, and a decimal reference noting the number of the cask and the distillery from which the cask came. So first of all, this, this color is our sweet, fruity, and mellow flavor profile. So this was cask 265 that we bought from distillery number 35. And then this one was called Meditation Medication. And then there's a brief tasting notes here and this one was 18 years old, and this was fully matured in a first fill bourbon barrel. This was bottled at 56.7%. Wow, we're bottling this whiskey at cast strength, so it hasn't been diluted. If you regularly buy whiskey, it might be 40%. That has been brought down to 40%. None of your store-bought diluted 40% whiskey here. This is the real deal. But what is the real deal? This has to be distilled, aged, and bottled in Scotland to be a Scotch whisky. Made with 100% malty barley, water, and yeast. Been distilled at least twice in copper pot stills, and then aged for at least three years in a day in oak. That's the rules for Scotch whisky. But we do bottle single malt whisky from all over the world. We have also bottled single cask, cognac, armagnac, gin, rum, bourbon, corn whisky, rye whisky. Wow. Um, but again, nothing goes in the bottle without passing the panel. And the most enlightening thing about whisky? Tasting it. And as much as I'd love to share my tasting notes on two flights of the society's finest, all I can say is that the memory is cherished, but a little blurry. We are in Scotland, and Scotland is part of the United Kingdom, so you will be using the pound sterling as your currency while you are here. But there is an interesting twist here. The three main Scottish banks issue their own banknotes, which look quite different from the Bank of England notes. However, they are both legal tender in both places. Scottish notes in England, English notes in Scotland. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Scotland feels quite expensive compared to other European countries, but it is comparable to the rest of the UK. Here in mid-2023, due to various economic and geopolitical shithousery, things are expensive. There's price creep in every sector you can imagine, especially food and drink. So eating out feels really punchy. And on that note, let's do the rundown. A cup of coffee will cost you around three pounds. A pound of beer will cost you around five pounds. And for the most reliable indicator of a nation's cost of good old Big Mac, you're gonna pay four pounds and nine pence, or around five dollars and 10 cents American. Let's talk about tipping. We rarely talk about tipping in Europe, especially in the UK, because it's really not a thing. However, in bigger cities like Edinburgh, you are increasingly seeing service charges of around 10 to 12% added to your bill. If you see that, you really don't need to add anything else in terms of a tip. But if you feel like rounding up to the nearest pound at a coffee shop or in a taxi, it will be appreciated, but certainly not expected. Let's talk about paying for things. My fellow Americans, this is for you. For the vast majority of transactions, you're just gonna tap your credit card or debit card on the reader and be done with it. 
The limit was raised to 100 pounds during COVID. And if you're using Apple Pay, Google Pay, Sam, any of that stuff, there's no limit, so tap away. If it is over 100 on your card, you will need to insert it, type in your PIN number, and then that's it. There's no signing necessary, unless, of course, you don't have a chip and PIN enabled card, which you will need to sign, but that's increasingly rare. So let's try and keep things a little simple. I don't know if I feel Scottish or not. It's hard to say when I wasn't born here and frankly haven't spent much time here either. All I know is I love haggis and I cry when I hear the bagpipes. So that has to count for something. But roots or not, I can say with certainty that Edinburgh has my heart. What a beautiful, energetic city. Yes, it can be a little on the touristy side, especially in the height of summer, but you know what? Somehow, that actually adds to this city's charm. I don't know how, but it does. It's like there and my awe and delight is transmitted. Like we're all joined in a collective sense of comfort and enjoyment, even just for a moment as we slide through cobblestoned passageways. Or maybe it's the whiskey, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's working. And I cannot wait to get back.